Industrial Revolution Part 1 All too often we associate industrialization with the growth of factory industry. When we talk of industrial production, we refer to factory production. When we talk of industrial workers, we mean factory workers. Histories of industrialization very often begin with the setting up of the first factories. There is a problem with such ideas. Even before factories began to dot the landscape in England and Europe, there was a large-scale industrial production for an international market. This was not based on factories. Many historians now refer to this phase of industrialization as proto-industrialization. Before the Industrial Revolution Part 2 In the 17th and 18th centuries, merchants from the towns in Europe began moving to the countryside supplying money to peasants and artisans, persuading them to produce for an international market. With the expansion of world trade and the acquisition of colonies in different parts of the world, the demand for goods began to grow. But merchants could not expand production within towns this was because here, urban crafts and trade guilds were powerful. These were associations of producers that trained craftspeople, maintained control over production, regulated competition and prices, and restricted the entry of new people into the trade. Rulers granted different guilds the monopoly rights to produce and trade in specific products. It was therefore difficult for new merchants to set up business in towns. So they turned to the countryside. In the countryside, poor peasants and artisans began working for merchants. As you have seen in the textbook last year, this was a time when open fields were disappearing and commons were being enclosed. Cottagers and poor peasants who had earlier depended on common lands for their survival, gathering their firewood, berries, vegetables, hay and straw had to now look for alternative sources of income. Many had tiny plots of land which could not provide work for all the members of the household. So, when merchants came around and offered advances to produce goods for them, peasant households eagerly agreed. By working for the merchants, they could remain in the countryside and continue to cultivate their small plots. Income from proto-industrial production supplemented their shrinking income from cultivation. It also allowed them a fuller use of their family labor resources. Within this system, a close relationship developed between the town and the countryside. Merchants were based in towns, but the work was done mostly in the countryside. A merchant clothier in England purchased wool from a wool stapler and carried it to the spinners. The yarn or the thread that was spun was taken in subsequent stages of production to weavers, fullers and then to dyers. The finishing was done in London before the export merchant sold the cloth in the international.
international market. London, in fact, came to be known as a finishing centre. This proto-industrial system was thus a part of a network of commercial exchanges. It was controlled by merchants and the goods were produced by a vast number of workers working within their family farms, not in factories. At each stage of production, 20 to 25 workers were employed by each merchant. This meant that each clothier was controlling hundreds of workers. The, the earliest factories in England came up by the 1730s. But it was only in the late 18th century that the number of factories multiplied. The first symbol of the new era was cotton. Its production boomed in the late 19th century. In 1760, Britain was importing 2.5 million pounds of raw cotton to feed its cotton industry. By 1787, this import soared to 22 million pounds. This increase was linked to a number of changes within the process of production. Let us look briefly at some of these. A series of inventions in the 18th century increase the efficacy of each step of the production process, carding, twisting, and spinning, and rolling. They enhanced the output per worker, enabling each worker to produce more, and they made possible the production of stronger threads and yarn. Then, Richard Arkwright created the cotton mill. Till this time, as you have seen, cloth production was spread all over the countryside and carried out within village households. But now, the costly new machines could be purchased, set up and maintained in the mill. Within the mill, all the processes were brought together under one roof and management. This allowed a more careful supervision over the production process, a watch over quality and the regulation of labour, all of which had been difficult to do when production was in the countryside. In the early 19th century, factories increasingly became an intimate part of the English landscape. So visible were the imposing new mills, so magical seemed to be the power of new technology, that contemporaries were dazzled. They concentrated their attention on the mills, almost forgetting the bylanes and the workshops where production still continued. industrial change. How rapid was the process of industrialization? Does industrialization mean only the growth of factory industries? The most dynamic industries in Britain were clearly cotton and metals. Growing at a rapid pace, cotton was the leading sector in the first phase of industrialization up to the 1840s. 
After that, the iron and steel industry led the way. With the expansion of railways in England from the 1840s and in the colonies from the 1860s, the demand for iron and steel increased rapidly. By 1873, Britain was exporting iron and steel worth about 77 million pounds, double the value of its cotton export. The new industries could not easily displace traditional industries. Even at the end of the 19th century, less than 20% of the total workforce was employed in the technologically advanced industrial sectors. Textiles was a dynamic sector, but a large portion of the output was produced not within factories, but outside within domestic units. The pace of change in the traditional industries was not set by steam-powered cotton or metal industries, but they did not remain entirely stagnant either. Seemingly ordinary and small innovations were the basis of growth in many non-mechanized sectors such as food processing, building, pottery, glasswork, tanning, furniture making and production of implements. Technological changes occurred slowly. They did not spread dramatically across the industrial landscape. New technology was expensive and merchants and industrialists were cautious about using it. The machines often broke down and repair was costly. They were not as effective as their inventors and manufacturers claimed. Consider the case of steam engine. James Watt improved the steam engine produced by Newcomen and patented the new engine in 1781. His industrialist friend Matthew Bolton manufactured the new model. But for years he could find no buyers. In the beginning of the 19th century, there were no more than 321 steam engines all over England. Of these, 80 were in cotton industries, 9 in wool industries, and the rest in mining, canal works and iron works. Steam engines were not used in any of the other industries Till much later in the century. So even the most powerful new technology that enhanced the productivity of labor manifold was slow to be accepted by industrialists. Historians have now come to increasingly recognize that the typical worker in the mid-19th century was not a machine operator but the traditional craftsperson and labourer.